I am at the Museum of Appalachia in Clinton, Tennessee. While the title may suggest that it's just an average quaint rural museum on local history, this is actually one of the most intriguing and unique museums in the entire country. Yeah, there's peacocks just wandering around the, the parking lot. Hey Appalachian cat, what's up? There's some peacocks on that fence post there. Here's a wood carving of an enlarged Mark Twain. This is the main entrance barn. There isn't much in there. It's basically like a Cracker Barrel gift shop, but it's merely the entrance building to the 65 animal-filled acres of the museum. Probably the most prominent animal here is the peacock. These colorful guys are all over the place. This is the Tom Cassidy house. He was a local folk musician who lived the last decades of his life in this little shack until his death in 1989. It's left exactly how it was by Mr. Cassidy. This is the Gwen Sharp Playhouse, built for a one-armed traveling salesman's daughter, and this was the only structure saved from TVA damming in all of eastern Tennessee. This stone bell adorned the top of the Southern Bell Telephone Building in Knoxville, and this is the first big building of the museum complex, the Appalachian Hall of Fame, which preserves artifacts of many unique people who lived in the region as well as the items of everyday people. First off, the grandfather clock of Sam Houston, leader of the Texan Revolution and president of the Republic of Texas. He was from Appalachia, and it is believed to have been his because his name is stenciled on the inside. This museum was created by John Rice Irwin, and what's interesting about the placards is that the presentation of the artifacts is in the form of a personal narrative. They're almost all handwritten and presented from his point of view. Hacker Martin was one of the last old-time gun makers in America, and he made this rifle for his son. The sign says, what better way is there to know a people than to study the everyday things they made, used, mended, and cherished, and cared for with loving hands. That's Abraham Lincoln carved from a buckeye tree. A display on Alex Stewart, who was a cooper, coal miner, blacksmith, furniture maker, dentist, musician, moonshiner, farmer, mountain philosopher, and master of a hundred other trades and crafts. They have a lot of examples of his wood carvings on display. Here's an interesting cultural practice around here. The penis bone or baculum of a raccoon is used as a toothpick, and that was Alex Stewart's baculum toothpick. Whittling has been a popular pastime in Appalachia. There's lots of folk art wood carvings made by a variety of artists. Here's the work of another famed craftsman, Joe Deal. Joe Deal carved this miniature mill in 1932, which is based on one he used to take corn to when he was a little boy. This is the devil, made by the devoutly religious Casey Jones. He found this natural walnut tree formation in the mountains, and he thought it looked like the devil, so he added eyes, painted a little bit, and added a set of horse teeth, and he called it the devil. A whole display on Appalachian baskets, paying tribute to the many talented basket makers of the region. Here is a display on Tennessee's gift to history, Secretary of State Cordell Hull. He served in that position under FDR from 1933 to 1944 and was an architect of the United Nations. He was born and grew up in nearby Birdsville. That was his trunk which he used to ship articles back and forth from his home here in eastern Tennessee. He's also considered the father of the graduated American income tax system 
And here are his 1953 income tax returns. There's also his personal invitation to the 1933 inauguration, signed by FDR and Vice President John Nance Gardner, as well as his leather portfolio. Sergeant Alvin C. York of World War I also hailed from Appalachia. He became a national hero and celebrity after heroically taking German machine gun positions, saving several of his own men. This is the type of German machine gun that he went up against, which the museum acquired after much difficulty. After the war, he did come back to a farm in Pall Mall, Tennessee, and this was his family's round dining table. That's Sergeant York's Law Clod Buster, which he used at his farm. That is a dining stool and cash register from Sergeant York's store and cafe, which he operated in Pall Mall after the war. There's the Sergeant's post-war pants and some other items showing his legendary status in his own lifetime. That's believed to be the razor case he carried with him while fighting in France during the war. That is York's leather jacket, which he really liked, and it was found 45 years after that photo was taken in an abandoned building filled with dirt and a nest of mice. That is a shotgun signed by Miss Gracie York, the sergeant's wife. They have some of his canceled bank checks, which shows that he was a farmer, oil well founder, store operator, miller, and founder of the York Bible School. Here are artifacts of old Jim Smith, the caveman, who is exhibited on an equal basis alongside Hull and York, despite being known for living in a mountain cave for 25 years. Moving on from the three mountain neighbors, there's some more items of average mountain folk. They do have a display on the Honorable Howard H. Baker Jr. of Huntsville, Tennessee, who served as a senator from 1967 to 1985. The Great Conciliator, as he was known, was a Republican who held the position of Senate Minority and Majority Leader. He was generally appreciated for his willingness to compromise to enact legislation and maintain civility. Baker gave the scotch of an eastern Tennessee sassafras tree to Senator Everett Dirksen of Illinois, who used it to keep his parked car from rolling downhill. The placard does claim this to be the most famous scotch in American history. The museum does have an area full of Native American artifacts. These Celts, which are over a thousand years old, were used for skinning animal hides. If you do visit, I do recommend reading the homemade personalized descriptions. A lot of them tell the story of how they got a hold of these artifacts, and they are much more interesting than the average museum placard. This is the Indian Stonehead. Found near the Sevier County Courthouse in Sevierville, it is believed to have been carved by Native American half a millennia ago, and it's a very unique and rare piece. Now this is one of the most interesting items in the museum, the Perpetual Motion Machine. It was created by a rugged scientist named Asa Jackson here in the Appalachian Mountains sometime during the antebellum period. This six-foot wheel contraption, according to legend, could spin without stopping. It could produce its own power, and it could run forever. As you can see, it is made of thousands of little wooden parts, and it's very complicated. When the Civil War broke out, Jackson didn't want the Yankees to get a hold of his technology, so he hid it in a cave and removed several critical pieces when it was unattended to, so that it wouldn't work. After 1870, Asa Jackson left his invention with the key pieces needed to make it run, and this machine has remained a broken puzzle ever since. No scientist has been able to figure out how it supposedly worked. Here are the contents and keepsakes of Jonah Asa Jackson's old trunk. He was the grandson of the inventor of the perpetual motion machine, and he had no idea how it worked either. Here's a collection of children's toys. Another sign states that what we had is what we made ourselves, showing the rugged individualistic spirit of the Appalachian ancestors. 
John Sevier was the first and only governor of the Lost State of Franklin, which existed in eastern Tennessee from 1784 to 1788. Then he went on to become the first governor of the state of Tennessee. These maple sugar items are from a sugar mill that John Sevier co-founded. A larger display of toys and items used by the children of Appalachia. That's a horrifying doll. They have a whole display on Appalachian music with lots of variations of iconic instruments, such as the fiddle. There's a fiddle of Tom Cassidy, whose shack we saw outside, along with a gourd fiddle of Andy Parkey. And here's a fun fact, the old-timey fiddlers thought that if you placed a rattlesnake rattler inside the fiddle, it improved the quality of the music. There are some mountain banjos. some of the more unique instruments, along with some mandolins and guitars. And lots of variations of the dulcimer. There's Ray King's Elvis style guitar. Bill Monroe of Kentucky was the father of bluegrass music, and they have his summer hat. Some items of Grandpa Jones, who was known as Everybody's Grandpa, and he was a popular old-time country singer and banjo player. Here is the trophy closet of fiddling Bob Douglas. He got his first pair of shoes when he was 9 years old, and at age 75 he won first place in the National Folklife Fiddle Contest. This was the medicine house of the hard-working Dr. Andy Osborne, which was located in Blackwater, Virginia. He was known for never charging his patients except those who could afford to and that offered, and just about every item in here is original. Upstairs they have some interesting Civil War relics. Both northern and southern soldiers often had to forage off the land and the private property of families, so many, especially here in Appalachia, hid their belongings, such as the Warwick family, who hid their savings in the sugar bowl, and the Martins, who hid their valued fill in this little coffin that they buried underneath their barn. David McKinney Carter was 24 years old when he was killed in the war. These gloves and this billfold are the only possessions he had left, and there are some other personal articles of men killed in the war. There's Bob Hill's Civil War chair, which he made while hiding out the war in a cave, a large ammunition box used at Franklin and Murfreesboro, and other items from the Civil War, a very impressive assortment of relics found on the battlefields of eastern Tennessee, or carried by the soldiers who fought at them. That is a wooden cannonball. Since the South was usually short on manufactured items, sometimes they made heavy wooden balls for their cannons. That is a now blackened and rotted hardtack, scavenged from the trash pit of General Joe Wheeler's encampment from Chattanooga. Examples of various commonly found items on the battlefields, like bullets, buttons, and coins. Some excavated belt buckles and other relics found from the battlefield of Saltville, Virginia. That is a genuine Civil War amputation kit. Civil War surgery was gruesome. This is the bitten bullet. Because there was very limited anesthetic, soldiers were often given a bullet to bite on when they got their limbs amputated, thus the term bite the bullet, and this bullet is confirmed to have teeth marks on it. Here's Dr. Huffmeister's surgical and pharmaceutical items. He served as a doctor on the Union and Confederate sides because he wanted to help as many injured soldiers as he could. Relics from General Longstreet's encampment, where his army stayed during the winter of 1863 and 64 in Upper East Tennessee. There's a Civil War era crutch, a surgery candle lamp, brass bugle, and some shoes. Some rifles, bayonets, and sabers. 
The musket at the top was apparently found with a skeleton. And this is Andrew Mock's Civil War Concealed Dagger Cane. And here's a display on the American Revolution with some weapons including a very elongated musket and other artifacts. During the time of the revolution, Appalachia was still very much frontier wilderness. There's some old wheelchairs. Items from the McDaniel Tooth Dentist Office. This was Uncle Dr. Ira Carter's buggy. Here's an exhibit on Appalachian death and funerals. There's an old Courier and Ives lithograph of William Henry Harrison's death, alongside various antique funeral cards and programs. Two unknown girls had their locks of hair tied together in this box, presumably when they died. That's a sample coffin and suit on display like it may have been at the funeral home. This is a fist coffin, a creepy cast iron coffin with a face hole. And there were some burials like this in Appalachia, and also John C. Calhoun was buried in one of these. Several more coffins along with grave digging equipment. And there's a classic cast iron hearse. They were well decorated back in the day. This is the mysterious Great Stone Head. Here's another Appalachian folk art display featuring the works of several craftsmen and woodcarvers. Fred Carter made these carvings of President Jimmy Carter and First Lady Rosalind Carter because he believed he was related to them. The artist thought Jimmy Carter smiled too much and wanted him to look more serious and statesmanlike, so there's no goofy smile on him. There's the head of Daniel Boone. That's a matchstick church. Very impressive. There's a Conestoga covered wagon, which was made by Moravians in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in the early 1800s. And there's many more typical everyday antiques up here. So that was just the first building. There is a lot more to see here. Here are two iron jail cells that were built in 1874, and they were in the small town of Madisonville, Tennessee. The cells would hold up to four prisoners at a time. The next building is the display barn. They have a lot of carpentry tools and equipment in here along with the tools of other crafts. Here's a display on the American Axe. This is the bank vault from Madisonville, Tennessee. The adjacent sign states that the popular 1950s Senator Estes Kefauver was from that town. This is the saddlery. There's a tar rock used for greasing wagon wheels and treating hogs for lice. All sorts of sewing and weaving equipment. This area is set up like an old general store, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. 
This is the tower clock from the old courthouse in Clinton, Tennessee, which was built in 1892. That's awesome. As you can see, this barn is packed, housing a fragment of the over quarter million exhibits on display at this museum. Here's some more folk art. It's important to note that people in Appalachia usually live pretty simply and they don't decorate their objects and tools, so relatively few people did any type of folk art. This is a carving of the John F. Kennedy Funeral Cortage, carved by Marshall Fleming of New Creek, West Virginia. This is the bedroom of Cedar Creek Charlie, who ended up with an obsession with painting and he painted almost everything in his house with red, white, and blue, usually in the form of stripes or polka dots. Gourd art is a thing around these parts. Some decorative canes. Here's an extensive collection of animal traps along with some taxidermy. There's a creepy clown in that buggy. Some Appalachian bells and horns. There's some beekeeping equipment. A display on the history of raising corn. While the barn is floor to ceiling full of all sorts of old agriculture and craft tools, it's still an interesting mix of the usual practical instruments alongside some insane things. The nearby People's Building houses a display on Harrison Mays, one of the South's most interesting folk artists. He was crushed in a coal mining accident and expected to die, but he didn't. As he believed God spared his life, he dedicated the rest of his life to becoming God's foremost ad man. He spent 50 years making these two ton each stone heart signs and crosses, as well as other signage, and he started placing them around the country. He never learned to drive, so he enlisted the help of his poor family and friends for his work, and he also didn't really know how to spell. Mays believed he would live to age 120 and would have the opportunity to travel in space, so he designated some of these signs to be placed on the moon and Jupiter. He didn't quite live long enough to evangelize to aliens, he died in 1986, and he left a whole bunch of these signs at his house which he had planned to spread to other areas. So now they're on display here. He lived in a giant cross-shaped house called the House of Many Crosses in nearby Tazewell, Tennessee, and this is a model of the house. They do have his shirt which he drew hundreds of little crosses in, along with his bicycle which he would sometimes use to get around, always evangelizing his firm beliefs of course. That's Harrison Mays' studio desk and library table. That's his travel map from the 1960s. He would find ways to go on the road and then find places to place his signs. While many of the signs are gone, there are still quite a few out in the wild today. Primarily in the south, I have stumbled upon them before, so if you're on the back roads or on old US highways, always keep a lookout for a Harrison Mays sign. And this sign really shows his profound beliefs in a single universal Christian religion and order with incorrect spelling. Also in the People's Building is a one room schoolhouse. These are the carvings of James Bunch who worked as a carpenter and took up the hobby of whittling with his pocket knife, and over the years, he created all sorts of great artwork.
that's an unnecessarily sized jug. And this is the 1920 Haygood Harness and Saddle Shop, moved here from Persia, Tennessee. So it's a genuine historic structure fully restored and moved here from its previous location. In fact, a big part of this museum is an entire historical Appalachian village of structures that were moved here. So it's kind of like an Appalachian Greenfield Village. Here's perhaps the most historic cabin in the village, the Mark Twain family cabin. While Mark Twain was born in a cabin near Hannibal, Missouri, this is supposedly the cabin in which the great writer and humorist was conceived. His parents lived in this cabin in Possum Trot, Tennessee, and they left for Missouri five months before Samuel Clements was born. So it's assumed they got it on in this cabin. This is the General Bunch House, the first cabin that was relocated to the museum in the 1960s. Prior Bunch was not a general. His son who helped build it was named General, so that's where the name comes from. But the Bunches raised 12 children in this two-room cabin that was located in one of the most inaccessible places in the entire state. They had to walk 12 miles across mountains to get to the nearest store. This is the Bunch Smokehouse, where meats would be stored, cured, and smoked. Surrounded by old millstones and a ginormous tree stump, stands the Old Sharp Corn Mill. This is the McClung House, built around 1790. The McClungs were one of the earliest settlers of the Knoxville area. This home was later used as a makeshift hospital during the Civil War. And there's a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt. That's the Mark Monroe Pioneer Law Kitchen. It was a pretty good idea to do your summer cooking in a separate building away from the main house because they would frequently catch on fire. This is a genuine Appalachian blacksmith shop where all the tools and weapons were made and repaired. They usually do living history events during the summer, so there is sometimes an actual blacksmith working here. This is the Wheelwright Shop. And here's the chicken pen. They live enclosed at the Wheelwright Shop. While the chickens have to stay in their cage, the wild turkeys are free to roam around outside and tease them. What do you want? Quit following me. This is the Broom and Rope House. That's pretty cool, a vintage cart of Doc Randall's old medicine show. This is the Daniel Boone cabin. It was built in the early 1800s, but it doesn't have any connection to Daniel Boone himself. But this cabin was used in filming of the 1977 CBS TV series Young Daniel Boone, and this was his frontier home. It is furnished with some of the oldest pioneer artifacts in the museum's collection. What are you guys doing? Why are you following me still? This is the Big Tater Valley Schoolhouse, built in the early 1800s. This is what a early mountain school looked like. This is Irwin's Chapel. The little log church meeting house was used for a longer period of time in southern Appalachia than it was used in other areas of the country. This one was built around the 1840s in the North Carolina mountains. Mm -hmm. 
This is the Peters Homestead. It was built around 1840 nearby the museum, and the family lived in this little homestead for over a century. This is an example of an underground dairy, which would be like a cooler in order to preserve items a little longer. This is the homestead smokehouse and meat house. One this size could store a whole year's supply of hickory smoked hogs meat. This was the whiskey still of Popcorn Sutton, a famed Appalachian moonshiner who built this authentic liquor still and operated it here in the foothills. He was considered a folk hero even in his own lifetime and was perhaps the last living authority on the subject of moonshine. And after he passed away in 2009, his famed moonshine still was brought here to the museum. This is a unique cantilever barn, otherwise known as an overhang barn. There are very few of these barns in existence, and it is an Eastern Tennessee Appalachian thing. Here's some sheep chilling out in the village. There are actually quite a few really cool relics that I missed here. This is one of those places that you can visit a hundred times and always find lots of new things, so I'm definitely going to be back. So wow, uh, this is now one of my new favorite museums. Uh, this place is just sprawling, so much cool stuff, uh, and so old school. I, this is one of the, the best places uh, that in the south that you can go to, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so definitely if you're on 75 going south or north, uh, try to make sure to stop here. I highly recommend. If you'd like to see other places I've been to, such as museums similar to this, uh, southern culture, northern culture, western culture, all sorts of stuff, so please go check those videos out, and thanks for watching.